Perfect. Let me double check. Perfect. All right. So just welcome everyone to week three of the Awareness Festival. Thank you for being here today. The stands for Tourism, Hospitality and Events. Team is made of Zach, Andy and myself, Andia. The Awareness Festival will be taking place every Wednesday of October at 5 p.m. with each week focused on a different topic. First week, we talked about the tourism industry in a very insightful way. And last week, we covered different topics on the hospitality sector. If you missed it or you want to listen to it again, we have uploaded both of them to our YouTube channel, The Group. And next uh, and last week, we'll be focused on the student and new graduate perspective of the industry. OK, so this week we are discussing events and we have our two guest speakers present. Thank you both for being here. Our first speaker is Professor Nandan Sengupta. Nandan is an associate lecturer at Anglia Ruskin University um, and is also a college ambassador for India at the Cambridge Marketing College. On top of that, Nandang is the director of the education management company, ESC Network, as well as having a great amount of experience in education consultancy focused on higher education and professional development. So thank you very much for being here, Nandan. Um, our second guest speaker is Mark McGivern. Mark has been one of the organizers of the Strawberry Fair for eight years, as well as a crew member before that. Mark has been Head of Communications, Vice Chair and Deputy Event Manager. Currently, he is Chair and Event Communi uh, sorry, and Event Manager for the 2022 Strawberry Fair. With great experience regarding the events industry, Mark has worked in other festivals as we're organizing his own. So thank you very much for making the time for us. Um, just a quick uh, reminder for everyone to please mute yourselves during the talk. And please save your questions for the end when you will have an opportunity to ask them to both speakers. Um, so without any further ado, Nandan, go ahead. Thank you. Right. Thank you very much, Antia and Zach and Andy and all the students. Uh, this is indeed a privilege for me to be able to say a few words over here at this particular platform. Um, so I'm sure I'd enjoy that. All right. So let me start what I'm going to talk about, especially with reference to um, event, event management, event marketing and all that. My personal experience is in the field of um, well, I am in education right now in academia for the last five years or so, but I wasn't so uh, for the last 35 years. So uh, five years education before that, I was mostly in um, corporate sector consulting, uh, doing marketing. And incidentally, I have had to arrange a number of events uh, during my professional career because I was in B2B. So I know the pains and satisfaction of an event management thing just a bit. Definitely not like Mark, not as an insider, but I have experienced some of those. And from that uh, perspective, I would like to share some of my thoughts in that particular sector uh, with reference to the knowledge of marketing and another particular area, which is very close to my heart, and I teach that as well, that is sustainability. So I'm going to talk about marketing and sustainability in the event management space and how those things are um, getting shaped up. OK, so um, and again, when I, I, I speak about all these things, I speak from a perspective of a marketer and sustainability pract practitioner. So um, in case of an event management, um, if we just go back a few years or a few decades, uh, we, we, we can see that lots of events, you know, any, any sort of event, business event, non-business events, or, or rather like, you know, events for, uh, entertainment, whatever, those things had marketing aspect all along, but 
usually the sustainability factor was not there very much. Generally, uh, we were, or rather, you know, the organizers and the marketers, we were encouraged to think about the final satisfaction and experience of those people, those who are coming into that event. In our language, the customers, those who are taking part in the events, those who will actually enliven the event, those people. And in marketing term, we we call these customer experience as CX, you know, a big C and small X. That's how we are going to do it. And by the way, I'm not using any slide or anything. It's just an informal discussion kind of stuff. So um, I hope that's OK. If anybody wants to have any any kind of um, documentation in support of my uh, in support of what I'm going to say, let me know and I'll try my best to to source one. OK, so in case of a CX, it was always um, the culture of marketers, event marketers, or in some cases, probably event organizers to make it as acceptable and attractive as possible. To, to make it as good as possible so that the registration in mind, again, a marketing term, you know, the, the experience that got registered in the mind of the customers would remain there for quite some long time. And in case of the events which um, get to be repeated every year or, you know, periodically, in that case, that registration in mind would help to bring back those customer with less efforts, as we call, as we say in marketing, you know, getting new customer is costlier than retaining the old customers. So definitely if you can have some, if you can leave some impression in your customer's mind, it will be easier for you to track them uh, during the next time when the similar event happens. Good, all very good. And people were working in this uh, way. And then during last few years, I should say during last eight to 10 years, the concept of sustainability started to, you know, go by lips and bounds. And definitely there were some reasons because, uh, because, you know, the human race as such all over the globe, they started to notice that things are happening which are not really are very acceptable things in climate, things in environment, and as such, those things which are affecting the lifestyle of people all over the world, which are affecting the business, which are even affecting the minute aspects of the business, like event, like um, product management, uh, like uh, you know product sourcing, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and. Um, the concept of sustainability started to seep in to uh, all sorts of business paradigm and event or event management is no exception. So there started some sort of practice in case of uh, managing the events more sustainably. Initially, it was a sort of, um, you know, confined to using non-plastic things, uh, not leaving CO footprint, CO2 footprints and that kind of stuff. And then we slowly started to realize there are certain challenges to, to these sustainable practices. Number one, two challenges, main, two, mainly two challenges. Number one, when you are going to put in certain sustainability practices in event management or in organizing an event, there are chances that the customer experience that I was talking about was going to be compromised just a bit from the customer's point of view. Now, for example, if there is a very, very enjoyable activity which leaves lots of carbon footprint, we take it off the list, that means the customers would think that they they are going to have to compromise those activities and therefore they are compromising their experience. However, nothing doing because that is unsustainable and uh, depending on where you are conducting this event in UK or somewhere else, 
uh, the enforcement of sustainability laws and acts might vary, of course, but depending on that, you may have to abide by those rules and compromise so-called customer activity. So, and that led to another situation from the marketing point of view, which is uh, the in marketing, we have a term called customers or consumers perceived value. CPV, which is not exactly the value or price of a product or a service, but the value that the customer is putting on that price, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, on the product or the service. For example, uh, let, if, if I take, um, let's say, uh, a costly phone, I'm not naming any brand, uh, a costly phone, uh, some people think, oh, well, it's worth queuing up for that phone when this is released on the first day and some people think that's a trash. Now that phone might be of certain price value, but those, those who are queuing up, they hold it in much higher esteem. They put a higher CPV on that particular phone, while those who think that this is a trash, you know, they don't really put any value on that. So CPVs differ. Now the same concept applies in events, although event is all about customer experience and some deliverables, of course, which are mostly intangible. Nevertheless, a customer might think that that event is more valuable to me as compared to the other event for which maybe the, the subscription or the entry fee is less, but that is not of any value. So that value I'm talking about. And in many cases, we have seen that when we are practicing sustainability and telling the customers that, look, this is a sustainable thing, sustainable event, um, please come there. In that case, customers are not directly telling us that, uh, well, I don't like sustainability, but actually what happens is that they think sustainability is something we must abide by, yes, but that means I'll have to compromise my CPV. Uh, they don't think in terms of CPV. They think in terms of customer experience. That that means I'll have to uh, compromise my experience. And uh, should I go there by paying that much amount or by investing that much time? So there, there lies a genuine problem in convincing people to come to events where the sustainability things are very seriously practiced. Now, the good thing is that um, in in many countries and lately during recent years, especially uh, in case of younger people, you know, like most of my students, they are much more conscious about this sustainability thing and uh, than our generation, which is an excellent thing. And they are ready, uh, much more ready, I should say, than than the elder generation. Um, to go and compromise, if necessary, their, uh, their, their experience level to a bit for the sake of sustainability, which is good. The point is, when as an event marketer, we are going to address the, our potential customers, that customer, uh, that customer uh, population, I would say, comprise of a number of segments. Some of the segments are sustainability conscious, and for them, we have no problem in convincing them to come to the event, even if it is a little less so-called uh, experience worthy. But for the other people, those who are not so sustainability conscious for them, the second challenge is this, to convince them. Now, the point is, um, I'm sorry, um, Antia, just let me know if I, uh, 10 minutes. Yeah, I have some more time, right? Okay. All uh, right. So in case of the second challenge, we have two solutions. One is uh, we educate the customers and the other is we leave the path of sustainability or even worse, we start greenwashing and um, telling people that we are being sustainable, but we are actually not being sustainable. So we are not compromising the uh, CVP, I'm sorry, CPV and CX. And at the same time, we are kind of ticking the check boxes, not being really sustainable, but 
we are able to say that we are sustainable. In other words, we are just, you know, um, finding loopholes. And I'm not uh, soliciting for that. What I'm saying is a realistic situation. That is the situation which happens in many regions, many countries, possibly not in UK, but it happens. Even if you look at big, you know, large festivals, even in UK, sometimes we see the kind of rubbish and trash left behind are not really totally sustainable, breakable trash. So in, uh, in, in, in today's sustainability standard, it is also very important to control the whole thing so that we can minimize our footprint at the minimum level. Zero is practically not possible yet, but we will have to work our way towards that. So, so there is a question of convincing people to come to those events so that those events survive, which is uh, as the generation go, uh, I, I, I think that will be less and less challenging. But in this customer segment, those who are not akin to sustainability or globally thinking where the sustainability practices have not caught up, this challenge will remain and this will remain for quite a while. It, it is not going to be solved in next five years or 10 years, maybe 50 years, but we have to be actively working towards this. That is what I'm trying to say. Now, this challenge is something which I would um, like to address in a way. Um, I would like to, um, this, this, this address is the future managers, you guys, basically, future managers, future professionals, future marketers, future event managers. Now, would you think that this 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 will be this will remain a challenge? This may be this may be remaining a challenge, and I suggest that we, those who believe in sustainability, those who believe in marketing, uh, you know, creating value for the society through marketing and through sustainability, we can actually treat that challenge as an opportunity which will probably provide us some sort of um, slot, some sort of window to take that and use that as uh, an enlightening, sensitizing opportunity for the customers, possible customers, those who still do not believe sustainability things and those who are really hesitant to become a part of the sustainable practices all over the world. So um, what I propose through this is this, whenever an event is happening, that's absolutely fine. We are going to be sustainable as much as we possibly can. Um, we are going to provide the best possible customer experience and the deliverables that we, we have promised. At the same time, how about event managers? Probably Mark can, uh, you know, comment on that more eloquently because I am not a, a, an event person. Well, he is. He knows better than I do. Uh, probably it could be a possibility to uh, hold very brief sessions uh, or to come up with a sustainability report, especially sustainability report on such events afterwards and use that for the next event or for the marketing purpose, which might show that despite sustainable practices, we have not really compromised the customer experience, number one. Number two, there are other new sort of customer experience which relates to one's own uh, spiritual satisfaction that I, I have been a part of this new drive and that could include you that is addressed to the customers and that could include those customers who are not really uh, yet willing to write this sustainability right so so probably once uh, that kind of this is just 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 a suggestion and maybe um, there could be some sort of activity which we can um, think about and uh, develop further on this line so I think that's all I had to say today. Um, and with this, I hand it over to Antia. So uh, I'll be here and I'll be happy to take any question in the end.
All right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nandan. That was very insightful. I'm sure you will have a few questions to answer by the end of this. <laughs> um, next, we have uh, Mark McGivern. Mark, please go ahead. Certainly, thank you very much. And it's likewise a pleasure to be here. I found what Nadan was saying very interesting because before I get into the, my part of the talk, I think I'll just address this from an organizer's perspective. Now, within Strawberry Fair for the last six or seven years, we've really been talking about sustainability and actually so is the industry. There is actually an association called the Association of Festival Organizers, which is an industry spokesperson and organizer that combines a lot of different festival organizers together as a body. And they've been doing a lot of work on sustainability and how to make festivals more sustainable. Now, from our perspective, there's three types of sustainability. There's the outward facing sustainability, which is, as Nandan said, things like not using plastic. So our food traders moving away from plastic utensils to more sustainable forms, both recycled wood or sustainable wood, which is the main one, or other forms of sustainable products. People have been experimenting with hemp plastic and stuff like that, which is overall more sustainable and better than oil-based plastics. And food containers not using polystyrene, moving towards the small sustainable containers and so on. So that's the first sort of placing. And we've made a lot of steps in that direction. The second step is unfortunately rubbish. Um, all festivals generate a large amount of rubbish. We've done a lot of work on encouraging food traders not to sell single use plastics, single use water bottles, to look at more sustainable forms of drinking glasses and, you know, actually using the kind of plastic style cups that are in fact compostable or recyclable rather than the old style, which just weren't. And what we do with our rubbish and actually engaging with the disposal agencies to get more of it recycled, to do more segregation of waste. And so that more of our generated waste doesn't end up just going to the landfill. There's the other issue of sustainability, which as an organizer is actually as if not more important, but it's the, it's the behind the scenes sustainability. <clears throat> the majority of festivals pitch up on basically a piece of green land of one form or another that doesn't actually have much in the way of infrastructure on it. And certainly you can't just plug into the grid. So everything from stages to lighting to even recharging batteries for uh, radios, etc., all has to be generated electricity. Now, in many cases, go back a few years and us at the fair, we had lots of individual generators. So every stage had its generator, every lighting point was attached to its own generator, which uses a tremendous amount of diesel, frankly, both with the emissions that come from it and also just the fuel use, the transport costs and everything else. We've been looking more and more and more at alternative energy sources. For the past few years, we've had one of our 10 stages completely solar powered. But a lot of the sort of portable power from renewable sources, whether it be wind or solar, the technology is not there yet. You end up having to transport a lot of batteries. And most festivals aren't actually in existence for long enough for them to be, gen you know, set up a solar farm and actually generate that electricity and charge batteries on site. So we've been looking at different ways of using power. Um, we actually put in place a gridding system so that we'd have central power points of generators, which would then run long, long cables trenched through the entire site to supply the stages, which reduced our diesel use by about 50%. Um, and we're looking to build on that more. But it is difficult because <clears throat> an event like Glastonbury, which is at a permanent site, has had decades to generate an infrastructure. And they're leaps and bounds ahead of anybody else on this. Where you simply just pitch up in a field that is otherwise a field, 
you have to bring all that with you and you have to consider the footprint side of it more and more and more. So I agree entirely with Nadan. And I think as technology advances, as we get better solar generation and more effective solar generation, the ability to use wind power directly at an event, that will improve. But that technology is still only emerging and some of it's very expensive. Now, just to explain my sort of role here, and the festivals industry is huge. Um, back in 2019, you'd have been hard pressed to find a weekend between May and October that didn't have at least two or three or more festivals happening somewhere in the country. Um, obviously, very few in 2020, and the majority did not happen this year. More and more are coming back for next year, and any search on Google for festivals happening will bring up a lot. Now, so that's the good news. It's coming back. Festival organizers have been working together. They've been working with government and with each other and within themselves to bring events back more and more and more. And from looking at the landscape for next year, it's not going to be that much less potentially than it was in 2019. But it is going to be somewhat different. <clears throat> the festival industry isn't just one of a bunch of stages with some lighting and a sound guy and putting on bands. It actually relies on a whole range of different industry providers, from infrastructure providers to the people who deliver the fences, for instance, the people who deliver the marquees, the people who put those up, security companies, toilet companies and um, refuse disposal companies, and their landscape's been changing. They've been affected by COVID. They've been affected by labor shortage. And actually, they're also being affected by a shortage of transport drivers. Everything has to be moved. And the majority of it has to be moved on pretty big lorries. So that landscape is very much one in which we're now just ourselves beginning to look at the costs of that. Now, Strawberry Fair, for those who don't know, is an independent in that it has no sponsors, it has no. Um, Overarching backers, it's free, which means there's no ticket price. It's free admission for any member of the public. And it's volunteer run. So everybody working on it is doing so in their free time. Now, our organization actually includes people who are new to the events industry, people who've worked at lots and lots of different festivals, people who've worked at Strawberry Fair for 20 odd years and also people who take part in Strawberry Fair, but also do paid work in other festivals. Some of our volunteers in the past have gone on to be part of the paid organizing team at Glastonbury, at Download, at Boomtown, at quite a lot of other festivals. One of our stage providers at Strawberry Fair is basically event controller for Crop Ready Festival in Oxfordshire. And we're finding and we have are looking at how to engage back with the wider public to bring all of those volunteers back in after two years absence. Now, that's not unique to us. The ticketed festivals rely on volunteers. There's a paid crew, but when you go to a ticketed festival, you'll see that the primary engagement of a lot of the public with the inside working of a festival is as a steward. Now, the majority of stewards aren't paid. They get a ticket admission in return for doing a few hours work each day on stewarding the event. <clears throat> Beyond that, an awful lot of events, stage managers aren't necessarily always paid. They come and do it because they love doing it. The tech crew sometimes get different rates of pay depending on what event it is. Some will go back and do the same event year on year, 
even though it's not actually as high earning as some of the others. There's a lot of volunteers, volunteerism or volunteering and an awful lot of goodwill that goes behind the festivals industry. And I know plenty of people who literally will spend May to October going from one festival to another and working at different ones through the year and doing a variety of different roles as part of that. There's also, it involves an awful lot of tradespeople in terms of carpenters, metal workers, structural engineers, designers, artists who actually make a you know make part of their living from doing a lot of the design work the building of structures if for instance anyone's been to places like Glastonbury the different areas are all built and they normally are built over the two to three months before the festival itself Boomtown has an incredibly elaborate building regime and that actually employs an awful lot of those tradespeople. Those skills are in demand and there is a skill shortage for them. And so festivals are competing with other industries, not least theatres, for a lot of the same set of skills and a lot of the same people. And you will find there are people who will design work, do design work in theatres, who will also do design work on festivals and they will do design work for other events as well. Same with people who do lighting rigs, same with people who do sound tech, same with people who frankly drive forklift trucks and move stuff around site, who have plenty of other outlets and plenty of other opportunities for work as well. So it's an industry that's coming back, but it's also an industry that's under pressure through the general skill shortage and a lot of these skills. <coughs> now, I think as well, it's worth mentioning that within all of that, the regulatory landscape behind festivals. 20 years ago, an awful lot of things like, or even 10 years ago, <coughs> there was a lot less focus on health and safety. There was a lot less focus on building regulations. When building regulations became, took over, and applied to temporary structures, suddenly every festival in the country had to do an extra range of certification and an extra piece of design to show that everything they were building was in accordance with the building regulations that applied to permanent structures. The regulatory landscape is also changing in respect of <coughs> the application of things which in other industries were seen as very normal such as the treatment of employees, the treatment of staff, the respect that people are due, which there was quite a lot of negative press within the festival industry a decade or more ago about exploitative working practices. So across both the voluntary and paid sector, an awful lot of work has been done and we've done it ourselves within Strawberry Fair to put in place better welfare arrangements, better treatment, complaints and grievances processes, and safeguarding processes across the industry. And all of those things have actually have taken up more and more and more time and require more and more and more management. And management teams for festivals have grown and grown and grown. So how am I doing for time? <laughs> You're doing fine. You're doing fine. Yeah. Sure. And I do, you know, and I think it's important to realize that far from being a sort of ad hoc kind of environment, it's becoming more and more and more akin to any other workplace. And that's both for voluntary staff and for paid staff. And that treatment of the individual and respect for the individual which frankly, I think we've all seen press reports about various parts of the entertainment industry and how it can leave a lot to desire. That's changing. And the best festivals have got really good, strong processes in place. And they have the teams of people to manage them. You wouldn't necessarily think that, you know, as safeguarding officers and safeguarding teams as being part of the festival environment, but they really are now. 
and they have to be. And that whole attention on both the welfare of the crew, the team, the artists, and the event goer. The amount of welfare provision that's needed to accommodate your audience, your customer base, whether that be a two or three thousand person small festival, Strawberry Fair, uh, we normally attract around 35 to 40,000 visitors over the course of one day. To Glastonbury, which is tens, if not hundreds of thousands of people on site. And so the growth of all these supporting industries of welfare, safeguarding, um, environment, sustainability, often means that you more of the crews are involved in roles that have actually no direct relation to what is the focus of the activity of most people going to a festival, which is the people on stage. And that base of management has grown exponentially. It's one reason why Strawberry Fair, we're reaching out for more and more and more volunteers, because there are so many things that can be done you just need the people to do them. I mean, we're looking at building up a much bigger sustainability team. We need a much bigger welfare team. We've just massively enhanced and retrained our safeguarding team to bring them up into line with the latest industry standards and qualifications. We're working much, much closer now, I think, than we ever were with our supply base. For instance, we have at Strawberry Fair two miles of fence, which is a lot of fence panels. And that's a lot of movement of stuff around the country. It's the same fencing that you see on building sites, etc. Harris fencing. It gets shipped all over the country. We're working much more with other event organizers locally to see if we can take their fencing or they can take ours rather than have it driven all over the country with the attendant carbon footprint, but also cost of transportation. We're looking at trying to work with our industry providers for toilet facilities to get greener alternatives to the standard port which are frankly nothing but giant boxes of chemicals. We're working with our security providers much more to get the best possible experience. Security, unless people need it, should be invisible but present. You know, it should be there, it should be there to manage, to observe, to regulate entry, but it shouldn't necessarily be a disruptive part of the customer experience. And working with security providers to improve their workforces, understanding the experience that we want to give and their role in delivering it. Also working a lot with the local providers of stage equipment, stages, to look at greener and better stages. Um, I'm sure everyone may have seen a lot of events use big inflatable stages because they're easy to put up. They also require a generator running the entire time that they're in use. They're not a sustainable thing and there's no way to take it if you don't have air being pumped continually into them they collapse so we want to get people to move away more from unsustainable to more sustainable technology and to try and work with people to see if we can improve that footprint you know and um, so I think the message is that actually the in industry is evolving, the industry is changing, while actually still from the outside delivering that same experience. The festival experience of going to an event, going around, seeing different bands, having a dance, having a drink, having some food, having if it's a camping festival, a safe place to camp, etc. All of that's still the same. But the way that we're delivering it is actually changing. And the way into that industry often isn't what people think of being on that stage part of it, but all the other aspects of event management. 
and being part of those bigger teams delivering that bigger vision for events. So I think that's me done. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mark. Um, it is, I, I personally find it reassuring to hear that the industry is doing so much to try to be greener, as green as we can, um, and that the future is always ever evolving, knowing that in 2019, we're gonna ha we had as many as we may have next year is is mind blowing. Um, so thank you so much, Mark. Now it is time for everyone to please write your questions for both Nandang and Mark. I see that we have a few already. Um, you can put them down in the chat, or you can raise your hand, and we will call you to talk. All right. So I'm gonna start with the chat questions that we have. Uh, this one is for Nandan. Can customer experience be hindered due to incorporating sustainable objectives during events? Uh, during, sorry, I couldn't get it. I cannot see the chat. During incorporating what? Uh, due to incorporating sustainable objectives during events. Um, honestly, I don't know. It could be. It all depends on the customer's perception about what it is. The moment you are putting um, any any sort of barrier challenges, there has to be good reason. And I'm sure as Mark explained in total detail how those things are being done. And thank you, Mark. I have been enlightened on that as well. Uh, apparently, that could be the case. But there should be um, some sort of, um, you know, space where uh, an exchange, as I was um, trying to say, as some sort of exchange of information might take place, and which is very, very easy these days in the digital technology space, where the customers can be persuaded to get more into that, explore that thing. And, um, you know, if there is just a perception of hindrance, then get over it. That's it. And I think yes. as well, and I think as well, you've got to look at the opposite side of that question as well, because what you can have is if you don't do those things, you can actually hinder people's experience as well. Correct. Yep. Yeah. And yeah. one has to probably mention that or or make that known, make people aware aware of that if if possible. Right. Yes. And I think actually as part of any marketing or any communications that yeah. events do. It's really be beholden on them to express what that experience is going to be. Indeed. Indeed, thank you very much, both of you. I love seeing that we can we can uh, move some conversation around here. Uh, we have one for Mark. Um, is there a general concern um, ar about the 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 amount of employees decreasing? Uh, for Strawberry Fair 2022, like things are happening now with the lorries. Uh, is there like a general concern? Are you guys only looking for employees or do you see careers actually developing nowadays? Well, I mean, because we are primarily a voluntary organization, mm -hmm. we're actually, there is a concern about getting the right number of volunteers, yes. Um, I think in terms of employees, we employ very few people directly. We primarily contract for services through suppliers of various kinds. And occasionally we do buy in specialist skills. Um, but in terms of that voluntary and people volunteering to come in, yes, that is a concern. I think the confidence is still low. And I think that a lot of work has to be done by us to bring more people in. And bearing in mind that um, the advantage that we can offer that a lot of other festivals can't is that we can actually very quickly train people up to do very what in other festivals would be very senior roles. We can embed people within trade and parts of the organization, which actually in a lot of paid festivals, people spend a long, long time trying to get into those roles. You know, being responsible, for instance, for running artist reception, for moving things around, moving act around the site. That's a really desired role in most festivals. And there's a lot of people want to get that because they get to meet the act. 
they get to work directly with them. It's what most people really want to get out of being in the entertainment sector. We can put people straight in that team and train them how to do it. We can train people how to run, manage security. We can train people how to manage welfare. We can train people how to do almost anything that they could then say to another festival, I've done it at Strawberry Fair. And that counts for something across the sector. We're a very well-known event and a lot of people working in the industry have worked with us. Mm -hmm. I see. Well, since evolving from that, then how can people uh, get involved with the Strawberry Festival? How can people apply to volunteer? They can look on our website and they can apply through the website or they can email I want to help at strawberry-fair.org.uk and that goes straight through to me and to our volunteer coordinator who will get right back in touch with them. We also, as a committee and as an organisation, meet every week and we are doing hybrid meetings at the moment where people can access via Zoom <coughs> or they can access in person and come along in person, depending on their need and location. Perfect. Thank you very much. We have another question for, I'm sure both of you can elaborate on this. Um, sustainable achievement through events post-pandemic or during recovery, how will customers perceive that? Is it more desirable or less considered? Mark. <laughs> I, from every conversation that I've had with anyone, it's seen as more desirable. People have become, I think actually, the pause or the enforced pause that all the very different lockdowns and this whole last 18 months have put in place, I've had a lot more people to reflect on those kind of issues. And actually, if you're not seen to be doing it, people notice it's an expected yep. thing. Yep, yep, yep. Um, absolutely quite agree with you. I just like to add one line, which is before the pandemic, probably it could have been a little different depending on which region of the globe you are talking about, you know? Uh, that is awareness of people that matters. But after the pandemic, probably all across the board, it's um, more or less same. As you were saying, people are conscious and yeah, it's it's more desirable, I think. Mm. Yep. Yes. That's great. That is definitely very reassuring to hear <laughs> that it is something that people are actively looking forward. Um, I don't know if Nandang would have like maybe any other advice for like how can events... Oh, sorry. Uh, it seems like uh, that was just me ranting. Can we, uh, Zach, do you have a question? Hi guys, yeah, thank you so much for your um, for your input there, really appreciate it. I just wanted to pick up a little bit more of that previous point because uh, when we look at like the, the tourism and hospitality sectors, for example, that we've looked at over the past couple of weeks during this, mm -hmm. this webinar series, um, you sort of think that, you know, as we come out of the pandemic, the need or the want to go traveling, for example, um, has greatly increased because people have been limited to where they can go, uh, if they can go anywhere at all. So I'm sort of thinking as well, like with regards to events, you know, so many people are so eager to get back to going to festivals, to going to events, whether it be in their own country or, you know, across the globe. So I'm just wondering if perhaps they would sort of put behind them the sustainability aspect, um, if if it hinders at all their opportunity to be able to go to these events. The same way in which is when we come out of the pandemic, if we can go traveling, you know, especially if you're a younger person and maybe a student, you don't have so much money, you're just going to book the cheapest flight, you know, the quickest way to go. You might not always choose the more sustainable option. So, so this is sort of my concern. I know, Mark, you said more people are, are interested in it, but how, how achievable, how viable is it actually? More I, I think there's two things there. The first one is people are not going to choose necessarily a, to go to a festival or a number of festivals because of its sustainability record. They're going to largely be drawn either by the name of the event or by the artists and acts and performers they want to see. So that's the first thing. It's the experience while they're at it and what they take away from it. I think if somebody, for instance, realized, was 
at an event and that the only sources of water were single use bottles. All the food came in unrecyclable plastic containers. <coughs> that would be noticed and it would be commented on and it would be thought about. It's not to stop people from going, but it may impact their view further on. You know, so I don't think any of those things, it's like nobody, for instance, when they go into a pub, largely thinks about the sustainability of the pub. And a lot of people, they go to a restaurant and they don't think about the sustainability of the food chain that led to what appears on their plate. But it is something which is in the back of a lot of people's minds, even if it's not in the front. And so it's that experience that if you can say that you're delivering part of that and be seen to be doing something about it, you actually enhance your overall reputation. Yep. yep. Um, yeah, okay. Uh, I would just like to add that um, what Jack said, um, he, he has a point there, of course, because people might just be tempted enough to cast aside all this caution. And now that we are free to go kind of symptom they, they suffer from, there might be an upsurge, especially in travel industry, to to ignore the sustainability issues. I don't deny that there is a possibility. However, with the um, upcoming trend in the consciousness, I am hopeful. That's that's all I can say. I'm hopeful of um, you know that thing being um, sipping in into into people's minds that well um, we have to abide by those things we should, and that's for the ultimate uh, better future of our planet and people, so on and so forth. So probably we should um, keep our hopes up. Um, yeah, and uh, if I may, I have a question for Mark because and yeah. that kind kind of stems out from what Jack said. You know, people people couldn't go to uh, events or or tour trips and all that kind of stuff. And I have seen quite a number of instances where virtual reality was applying either in the form of pure virtual reality or in the form of just digital experience through live camps and stuff like that. Do you think that's going to be a trend in um, the hospital, um, not hospitality, but in events and tourism industry in future? I think it's going to be a trend. I'm not sure how dominant a trend it's going to be. Right. Um, for instance, for Strawberry Fair, we have talked about live streaming things before and prior to the pandemic, but our income streams rely on people actually being on site. It relies on the traders knowing there's a footfall. It relies on the bars knowing right. there's a footfall. So I can see a lot of paid events actually went enhancing their attendance by doing both ticket sales for people to physically come and also for some form of virtual ticket for certain performances. All right. OK. There's a range of issues there, of course, around performance rights and broadcast rights yep. of performance acts. Um, and that's another reason why we've shied away from it, because the legal side and what happens in terms of the rights to that performance, the law has not yet caught up with all the digital world and people's rights to their creative output. Quite right, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know. And I think there's more to be done in that sphere before yep. you can do a lot of those live streamings, particularly Quite. at where you've events where you've already got people present. Right. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Good. Okay. So um, thank you very much, both of you. That is all the time we have for today. Yep. So that is the end of this session of the Awareness Festival. Thank you, everyone, for being with us today. If you have any other questions, you're more than welcome to email us or reach to us through our social media. Um, and we will make sure to forward our guest speakers your answers. Thank you again, of course, to both Professor Nandan Sengupta and Mark McGivern. Thank for you very much. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. And thank you to the three of you for inviting me. Of course. Thank you very much for being here and for giving us such amazing experiences and insight in the events industry. Um, I am sure we have all found it as helpful as I personally did. Um, just a reminder uh, that along um, our information on the chat, uh, we have left um, a feedback 
platform for you to give us some feedback. If you could, if you can't see it, we will send it to you personally. No problem at all. Um, next week, we will be discussing the student perspective regarding the sector's crisis due to the pandemic, as well as how do we see ourselves regarding its recovery and evolution. We hope you join us again next week on Wednesday at 5 p.m. <laughs> and give us a follow on both Instagram and LinkedIn to keep updated if you can. Thank you everyone again and see you all next week. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for having us. Thank right. you. Thank you guys. Thank you. Have Thank a good day. Bye bye. Bye.